Why do you think psychedelics are so important and interesting to explore? Yeah, I mean, I think like the, the first intuition pump here is imagining what it would be like to try to study physics or chemistry if you were fully constrained to room temperature physics and chemistry. I'm sure you can do some interesting discoveries and advancements, but a whole lot of physics actually shows up in, in the high energy spaces or the ultra low energy spaces. And in some sense, it might even be impossible to settle down on a standard model of physics without looking at what happens in these exotic temperature or pressure regimes. And I think likewise, there's a lot you can say about consciousness and qualia by just looking at its quote-unquote room temperature properties, which I would say is the standard everyday life uh, human type of experience of somebody who doesn't have any serious mental illness. And you can discover quite a few fascinating things, but I do think the information is rather limited. And also, you may actually discover things that you think are universal rules, but actually you find all sorts of counterexamples in other states of consciousness that may be a little bit more exotic. Now, what I just said would build the case for just studying consciousness in any other state <laughs> other than the normal, everyday, sober, not severely mentally ill states of consciousness. But there's something special about psychedelics that actually makes those states uniquely interesting, or I would say much more interesting than other altered states. And perhaps I, if I were to kind of uh, rank substances or rank uh, altered states based on what I consider to be research priorities, I would probably say something along the lines of 5-MeO DMT would be at the very top in terms of how much we can learn from it scientifically in understanding consciousness. Then I would place MDMA, then DMT, then all of the psychedelics, and after that, all of the dissociatives. And after that, well, it doesn't matter that much. They're not that interesting. <laughs> well, it depends. I would probably put uh, Ibogaine also very, very high up, even though Ibogaine is very hard to classify. It's not exactly a psychedelic or a dissociative, but it seems to be extraordinarily interesting in its own right for many, many deep reasons. What makes uh, psychedelic states of consciousness in some sense, uniquely fascinating or uniquely informative is that A, they increase the energy parameter of your experience. This is kind of a analogous in some sense to, to studying physics at temperatures above 100 degrees Celsius, where, <laughs> you know, you take a glass of water at 40 degrees and you say like, okay, it's just plain water. You take it to 80 degrees Celsius and you say, it looks kind of pretty much the same. And you kind of infer that, well, it's just going to get warmer, but nothing interesting is going to happen. But then you heat 100 de degrees Celsius, and it actually starts boiling and turning into gas. And this like weird, completely new transformation that happens. And I would say that increasing the energy parameter of your experience on psychedelics, there's something kind of similar, really unexpected phase transitions that really change how consciousness behaves pretty dramatically. And likewise, Let's say you take 10 micrograms of LSD. Hey, that's kind of a little bit of a, a lukewarm consciousness, a microdose. It's a little bit different, a little bit more fluid, but you know nothing to write home about. You take 50 micrograms of LSD, and uh, okay, this is getting interesting, but still there's a lot of commonalities with normal everyday life. You take 200 micrograms of LSD and like, oh my gosh, the walls are melting and your thought processes are completely scrambled and the way you make associations is completely different and your imagination is capable of constructing entirely new laws of physics and there's a, a kind of like a fluid instability in your consciousness, all sorts of exotic phenomena that really doesn't happen in normal everyday life. In particular, the reason I highlighted 5-MeO-DMT and, and MDMA as maybe the, the top two substances to study as I see it is because they interface with valence so directly. MDMA, if you don't take it often and you take it at a, at a sensible dose, it's extremely likely that you will just have a very good experience, an experience that you might rank as one of the top 10 in your life, extremely, extremely delightful and pleasant and a weird, actually kind of unheard of combination of 
extreme excitement together with uh, equanimity and peacefulness. Room temperature consciousness rarely experiences, you know, that type of overlap. And then on MDMA, it's like everywhere, you know, <laughs> there's like the texture of reality becomes this blend of excitement and equanimity. What the hell? <laughs> and it feels amazing. It really feels like falling in love. The feeling of love feels extremely genuine. There's nothing fake about it. And also the, the feeling of self-love and, and acceptance. And there's even been some uh, recent research on the game theoretical implications of MDMA. Get a, a person to play a prisoner's dilemma on MDMA. They seem to be more cooperative. All of that seems to be extremely relevant, <laughs> especially from the point of view of where we are in history that we need to find technologies for cooperation and finding ways of reducing suffering. And then 5-MeO-DMT is also fascinating because, first of all, it produces the most convincing and believable impression of open individualism. A lot of people mention something like, you merge with the Godhead or with infinite consciousness <laughs> or the ground of being on 5-MeO-DMT. Don't get me wrong, this happens in other psychedelics as well. It's a relatively common thing that happens on high doses of LSD, for example, but it's never guaranteed. And even then, like on LSD, you always experience all sorts of other crazy things in addition to a quote-unquote mystical union, whereas on 5-MeO-DMT is oftentimes just the mystical union, just the core effect <laughs> that is the most profound, just running at you at a super high speed <laughs> just a few seconds after you inhale 5-MeO-DMT. And that makes it super important, again, from a game theoretical point of view, fostering cooperation. If we all switch our mindset from believing in our ego identity and switching into a consciousness-based identity, the world would potentially become much better very quickly. And 5-MeO-DMT has that potential. But even more so, 5-MeO-DMT produces the highest valence states that we know of. I did a lot of research last year on basically ranking experiences and comparing them in terms of the amount of bliss, how sublime they are. And basically, 5-MeO-DMT tops the charts when you have a good experience, which is actually also something to point out that sometimes you can have a hellish experience and also that makes it a pretty dangerous substance which is why I think of it as much more of a scientific research tool than something that we should just give uh, free samples in the street or, or anything of that sort. But done in a, in a really good set and setting, the chances of a good trip are very, very high. And those good experiences tend to be on a completely different order of magnitude or level than other positive experiences. If MDMA can put you in a 7 out of 10 feeling of wholesomeness and bliss and connection with the sublime, 5-MeO-DMT seems capable of putting you at a 10 out of 10. People say like it just maxes out how good you could possibly feel. And well, obviously that seems an incredibly important thing to study. From a raw scientific point of view and anybody who's even remotely interested in consciousness, it makes a lot of sense to save a special place for studying 5-MeO-DMT. But all of the psychedelics are severely understudied. I think we're about to experience a huge overhaul of the paradigm of how we understand consciousness thanks to, yeah, the psychedelic renaissance and, and scientific research being more focused on these altered states of consciousness. I think it's going to be as monumental of a transition as switching from a geocentric model of the universe to a heliocentric to recognizing that, hey, we actually just experience a tiny region of the state space of consciousness. <laughs> Our normal everyday life consciousness is not the center of the universe. And there are things that are just far more brighter and in some sense, far more significant. <laughs> and yeah, it's just a matter of uh, exploring it and studying them. <laughs>